um, in this location in the great Northwest, we could expand, you know, into fishing. We can uh, um, expand into agriculture. You know, we have a lot of um, people um, leasing our lands and then turning it over. But we also have the generations that used to work the land. They used to do the hay and they used to do the um, granary. You know, why are we not utilizing our own resources in um, teaching our young um, adults to um, take charge and get that physical labor, physical activity outside and enjoying the uh, resources that we have out there. We also have a lot of um, salmon and um, nature, natural resources that can be tapped into um, for jobs. Um, just for instance, it was, it was a good thing um, that I seen on Facebook where the um, program took students out and taught them how to dig. I think that's awesome. And we need to tap into those types of creativity um, here on our land with our own people while we're sustaining our culture. Thank you. Go right ahead, James. I'm talking about. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. As I was saying, I think we are in a in a good place right now, and uh, one of the silver linings of uh, uh, fighting this uh, pandemic is that we are forced to become creative in ways to develop uh, jobs and develop our economy. As many of our enterprises were shut down, uh, there are ways that we can create jobs and also support current enterprises and make them more efficient, uh, as well as through agriculture practices. There's a possibility that our tribe may end up having to uh, actually start working our own land in creation of a tribal farm, which would create jobs. Uh, the uh, development of uh, alternative energies will provide opportunities uh, for job creation as well. But I would also like to emphasize the tribe supporting and uh, nurturing uh, entrepreneurship and having our own people create businesses that will create the jobs for, for our people. Thank you. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay. Okay, well, thank you. But first of all, um, I think, you know, with the COVID funding that's available, one of the unfortunate things is that, you know, the way that the funds came about, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and, you know, we've all lost loved ones. So it, it's very un unfortunate that, you know, the money came about in this way. Um, because no amount of money can make up for the loss of lives of, of our loved ones. But as far as the this platform topic, I think a lot of things that we could do or we need to do more of is strategic planning. And that takes a lot of work, uh, but it's, it's beneficial in the long run, as well as priority planning, making sure that we have priority, especially for the funds that come about from COVID because they're very specific. And we could do a lot of planning and there may not be funding available in that category. So we need to 
make sure you know what we're planning for that we plan appropriately. Uh, the other thing regarding jobs, you know, it's it's great, you know, if we could create jobs, but one thing I think we we also need to do is review our own human resource manual, especially the the uh, hiring process. I think it needs to be reviewed and revised because it you know it takes sometimes weeks or sometimes months for people to you know to uh, be put in place in a job. And I think the other thing would you know we need to plan for the best use of the limited resources that we'll have. So uh, thank you. Mary Jane Miles. Thank you, Cheryl. I like what um, everyone is saying, and I especially like the day labor program because it is open to those of us and our family members who are unable to work for a full day and they can work one or two hours. I uh, want to uh, credit some of them that have already done this for the elders, like mowing their lawn or going in and washing their dishes or just really visiting with uh, the lonely elders. I also like uh, Mr. Penny's uh, idea of strategic planning. We have the University of Idaho, which is a great agricultural school and a forestry school. We have forestry programs and someone said about uh, tilling our own land uh, rather than having uh, uh, renters. And I read one one year that uh, the Camas Prairie produced the six uh, highest millionaires in the United States. And I thought, well, that's our land. So I think that we we need to think outside the box. And I think that we the leaders that we have now have been doing that and. I feel that um, we've got a lot of talent out there that uh, could put good ideas to work. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mary Jane. Please go right ahead, Ferris. Thank you, Cheryl, appreciate it. Um, like all the comments that have been said previously, uh, you know that uh, we've uh, started a a process of uh, uh, farming grapes, you know, and this area has been uh, uh, identified as one of the top uh, best areas to produce grapes. So there is research going on, strategic planning that is going on right now that we're involved in. Um, I think we should uh, see the end in the beginning instead of the end in the end. Uh, um, when we come on someone um, that is in uh, dire need, this uh, day labor program was a good start, but it's a start. And uh, uh, we have to give uh, people values. We have to value them so they will value yourself. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Ferris. Um, go right ahead, Ryan. So I do appreciate the day labor program. I was able to work with the team that were a part of this program. Good. Like I said, I, I was able to work with the few men from this program. I know they helped out during the um, food and supply distribution at the Piney Was. Um, I would like to see the program expanded to our Fino and Cameo. I'm not sure if they're present up in those communities, but um, I did appreciate the help because that was a lot of work with the uh, food and um, supply distribution. Uh, my other question, I had a question, um, who is the director of the program? Um, contacts and how long will the funds last? And that's it. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, thanks for that question. I think we're gonna have to table that right now, but appreciate it. 
Um, we're going to go ahead and keep this moving, um, moving on to James Spencer, who will be talking about his platform on climate change, land uses, and alter alternative energy uses. So please go right ahead, James. Yes, thank you. Uh, on climate change and land use, uh, you know, kind of dovetails into many different things. And uh, what I would like to see is uh, our tribe begin taking control of our lands and uh, controlling what's placed on our lands. We have many farmers leasing our lands and we don't know what chemicals are being placed on it. We know many of these chemicals will build up over time. We want to build a healthy soil and the technology now is available to us to start regenerative agriculture practices, which is known to sequester car carbon. And that way we can really start doing our part in battling climate change. I really loved seeing the tribe moving towards alternative energies with installing the solar system and training people to install and maintain those systems. I think we're on the right track, but there's more that we can do. And through that, there's job creation. Um, the uh, alternative uh, regenerative agriculture practices uh, will help to clean the soil, help clean the water, and help in salmon recovery as well. This will have a good impact on tourism and fishing. Uh, we have our own tribal members, you know, the Nespers tribe has, ha has a 16,000 year uh, relationship with this land that's confirmed although our oral history goes further back than that. And so we know this land. And a lot of these uh, new uh, technologies and, and uh, philosophies in agriculture uh, actually parallel traditional practices of our people of not turning over the land. Uh, you know, we're taught that uh, there's only two times to turn over the land and once is to dig roots and the other is to bury your dead. That's the only time that you turn that land over. And so we need to move that on into the agriculture practices as well. Um, the, uh, the, the teachings of the people are still alive and well, and uh, we've kind of forgotten it. And uh, just like in the timber industry, they discovered that, uh, well, you know, clear cutting was not a very good practice. Now on the agriculture side, we're showing uh, scientific studies that uh, turning the earth over is not a very good practice. If we switch over to these uh, practices, regenerative agriculture, then um, we'll reduce or eliminate our reliance on, um, on chemical fertilizers, uh, herbicides, and pesticides. Uh, this will have an effect on better soil quality, better food quality, more nutritional value, and better water quality for salmon recovery. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we need to pursue and uh, something that is very important for the seven generations to come. Uh, we're not the uh, owners of, of the land, we're the caretakers. We're borrowing it from future generations. And it's our responsibility to be good stewards and to save this planet, save this land for those future generations. Thank you. Thank you, James. Go ahead, Sam. Well, thank you. Well, I think right now, as far as climate change, I think we're with the current administration, which is, of course, very, very favorable to, to working on climate change as opposed to the last administration. So I think the tribes across the country are in a good position right now to really push forward with, with climate change, you know, with fires and floods and all these things taking place. I think what we learned from the fires from a few years back is that you know, we really need to build up our own emergency response capabilities because many times 
the tribe, tribal lands or tribal members properties are, you know, not the priority of, of local entities as far as protecting those, those areas. So I think, you know, we could do a lot of things with, with climate change, including our emergency response. As far as the land the planning, I think the Land Enterprise Commission uh, would need to work on that. And I think what James mentioned about the pollution, what they call uh, non-point uh, solution is, is very important too. And then, you know, with the recent uh, hemp ordinance being passed by NEPTIC and then the governor signing that, uh, that use of hemp is now legal in the state of Idaho, that, you know, that's another thing we need to plan on as well as making sure that we monitor the uh, U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management on how they're managing federal, federal lands that, that we have treaty reserve rights on. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Go ahead, Mary Jane. Thank you. I think the weather is crazy, and I think we could use uh, some crazy ways to use it with the wind, um, wind engines and uh, the wind especially has been um, pretty forceful, but it's crazy all over the, the world, I think. And it, it, we are the stewards of, of this land. This is our homeland. I think that uh, we probably live in the most beautiful homeland of all. The, the mountains are beautiful. I think the table is, the Kuyitz was really, um, uh, supreme in its uh, stewardship measures because I've listened to them talk around the table about what is the best for the land and especially the river. Uh, the Clearwater River gets its name from the Clearwater. Mom used to always say you can count every rock on the bottom and it and you can and a lot of tourists uh, love this land or people that come to us and stay with us never leave this land so you know that it it is beautiful and that is her job to take care of it so i i appreciate this um this topic here and i want to thank you great thank you mary jane really appreciate that um go right ahead ferris thank you um you know uh they they have developed a, pot, a crop of wheat that is a perennial, not an annual. And the roots go down deep into uh, 10, 12, 15 inches into the soil. So that way they don't have to kill our mother as been stated earlier. And uh, uh, carbon, carbon sequestration has, has helped a lot. So uh, there's ways out there. And uh, with our young people getting educated and just like uh, Shirley and James and Sam and everybody said that, uh, you know, we got to remember who we are and where we come from. And if we can do that, um, indigenous people, and, and this is continent, but around the world, never divided science and religion. They were put together. And, uh, and a good example of that is uh, my father's Laguna Pueblo. They have the Kiva. And they used to take their seeds down to the Kiva and put it with different soils. So whatever sprouted, they knew what to plant. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ferris. Let's go ahead to Ryan. Okay, so with this topic, I was just reading up on AOC and her uh, new green deal and how important that can be towards tribes across the US and also with coming up with different um, ways of using like renewable energy and also um, like our treaty rights. I think of our treaty rights and how we have to protect them and why they were so important to our chiefs that came before us. Um, I really like Emmett Taylor's fight um, with the uh, Midas Gold Corp and how we opposed, you know, the gold mine. And, you know, this gold mine was actually out of Canada. So um, personally it affects me and my family because we go down to South Fork every year and just seeing how the fish numbers have declined, you know, it's really put a damper on our trips down to South Fork. And I have a younger brother 
Um, he's 19 now and he, you know, he loves to fish. He lives for going down there. And I've been personally going down there for like 20 years. So just hearing about things like, you know, this gold mine, this, um, the gold mine, um, company coming in and, you know, polluting our waters that harm our fish, our animals and our wildlife, you know, it, it's personal for me. And that's just something that, you know, I want to keep a pulse on is just protecting our treaty rights and our land base and everything that, you know, centers around mother nature. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, Shirley, if you could just close this out on this platform, that'd be great, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, this is very important. What, what I am so thankful for being uh, Nest First is that we have started the, um, solar the solar panels. So we just need to expand on those in the other two communities. Um, also, we need to, it's a great time right now too, because we're um, starting to breach the dams, which is gonna be such a big, huge issue for our um, climate climate and change and then you can also see that um within our tribal right now i'm not sure how many individuals know but we are doing we have a bio um, climate program that does um they have different programs going on that will help sustain the bugs the certain bugs that eat the weeds. And, and I think that's so much better than having the pesticides. And that's what our own tribe's doing right now today. So I think we just need to focus on what we're doing and expand it um, as big as we can, get more jobs into these places. Also, um, just being proactive um, in the national as, and also in our smaller communities. It's just, just to, um, recognize what the climate change is doing to our natural resources, but at the same time, um, support and um, boost the departments and the programs that are being uh, proactive right now today. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Wow, this has been amazing hearing all about solar panels and climate change opportunities and expanding. Um, this is all good stuff, so thank you all for um, sharing your ideas on that. Um, the third platform we'll be hearing from Sam Penny, who'll be talking to us a little bit about American Rescue Plan, um, some of the tribal provisions that um, maybe we have planned. Um, please go right ahead, Sam. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd just like to reiter reiterate what I said earlier about you know the fix of COVID-19 on on our families, tribal families. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about HR 1319, which is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2020 or 2021. And it's often called uh, the American Rescue Plan or ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. And it was passed in law on March 11th of this year. So within this act, there are 31.2 billion dedicated for, for tribal governments and native communities. Uh, 20 billion of that is for tribal governments to grant COVID-19 and stabilize tribal communities uh, safety net programs through Treasury State Local Corona Virus Relief Fund. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. Um, some of the funds are there are other categories uh, within the law, but I just picked a few out just to share with you uh, here today. So there's six plus billion for Native American health systems, including the Indian Health Service. Uh, for example, there's 420 million uh, for mental health and behavioral behavioral health. Uh, for un, there's 1.248 billion for housing ur urban development for tribal and native Hawaiian housing programs, and there within that fund there's 450 billion for Indian housing block grant program, and there's 1.1 billion for education programs. Included in that are, is 142 million for tribal colleges and universities, or there's 1 billion for native families. There's 900 million for BIA programs. And for example, there's 100 million for housing improvement program. 
and there's 19 million to combat uh, domestic violence. And then there's 600 million for critical economic and infrastructure investments. An example uh, of use of those funds would be the, there's 100 million for critical infrastructure projects in native communities. And there's 20 million to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on native languages. So I just wanted to share a few of those figures with you. And what I think is critical at this point is, you know, the allocation of these funds uh, on the American Rescue Plan, how are these funds going to be allocated? So right now, I think NEPTIC and tribes across this country are, have been having consultations with the Department of Treasury and other federal departments on how, what kind of distribution formula they'll be utilizing for this, for the funds. But some of the suggestions have been that the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, form a uh, tribal advisory panel to provide guidance and reduce uncertainty on permissible uses of these funds to, and to provide technical assistance. And the reason that's important is, you know, we don't want tribes to spend a lot of time planning and then find out that, you know, that's an unallowable use of the funds. So that's why I mentioned earlier that the strategic planning and priority planning is so important. So we need to identify short-term and mid-term tribal priorities for the use of these funds. And we need to identify funding allocated, allocate for the various priorities that I just mentioned. And then we need to, of course, create action plans uh, and then eventually implement those action plans. So that's just a quick summary of, of the DAC. I think it's a uh, very important, it'll probably never happen again. Uh, that much funding for, for tribes across this country. And I just think it's a opportunity for the tribe to do great things with this fund. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of opportunities. Um, Mary Jane Miles, do you have some comments on this? Excuse me. Excuse me. When I was watching the new administration's plans on uh, this American Rescue Plan, I was really uh, pleased that he's uh, continuing on to help the American people. But what really surprised me when I was looking at his list was the third on his was to provide for in-home services for senior citizens, for elders, who are living alone and those that uh, do have family, but they are all working. And I think we have uh, run into that situation here, even with uh, people have to work and usually the nurses are working. The BIA programs, I hope with all his uh, new uh, people that he put in, like Deb Halen into uh, infrastructures that will uh, broaden the uh, Native American scopes. I think that uh, the BAA programs will um, be, I hope, reinvigorated so we will have more, uh, more services to our people. The probate is so slow that I wonder sometimes why we can't uh, get the BIA reinvigorated again for the Native American people. I like this uh, new administration and I, I laud um, Biden on what he's doing for uh, the minorities. And so I'm, I'm glad we're at a more secure place today. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Mary Jane. Um, we'll move on to Ferris Faisano. Thank you. Um, I was excited about uh, this rescue plan. My mother and father worked their whole lives. So when it comes to applying for programs, we were over income, not being able to qualify for anything. So we basically lived in substandard homes most of our lives because they both worked and were able to qualify for uh, HUD homes or whatever. Um, and I live in a home that right now in Lafayette it was built in um, 1910, 1912. 
has galvanized pipes or lead pipes. I would say about the majority of the houses in Lapway are in that predicament. And with this rescue plan, uh, the president said that he's gonna get rid of lead pipes in the homes that affect the, the children and the occupants. So that gives me great hope. And, you know, we were, uh, Indian tribes are basically the Flint for the rest of the world. Flint had the water problem too. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Ryan Oatman, do you have some comments? Yes, I do. So I am thankful for the American Rescue Plan and I'm thankful for some of the stuff that's outlined in this plan, like for one, behavioral health. I know over this uh, pandemic, um, everyone's mental health was um, affected, you know, from babies all the way up to elders. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that our Nimipu Health, Behavioral Health will, you know, receive some of this funding. And I'm really thankful that we even have a Behavioral Health here on the Nespers Reservation. And I know most of the workers that work at Behavioral Health and they do a good job. Um, I'd also, I'm also thankful for the funding for the domestic violence and new beginnings program with Carrie Picard. You know, I've worked a lot with this program. Um, when I work with youth, you know, they provided a lot of um, educational uh, presentations to the youth on teen dating violence. For the month of October, they provide a lot of um, education on uh, domestic violence within the communities. Also, housing. Being a social worker, I know housing is tough here on the Nespers Reservation. And I hope that we are able to build more housing because a lot of houses have multiple generations living under one roof. Thank you. Yes, a lot of housing needs indeed. Um, Shirley, comments please? Yes. Um, <laughs> I am very thankful for the American Rescue Plan and I'm hoping that we can use the funds as a tribe to um, finalize and progress into the living, the assistant living for our elders. I know that was passed and we were, you and I believe we even had a location picked out. It was just the funding. So hopefully with this funding, we can um, move forward on the stuff that, um, you know, had to take a um, seat in the back, back. But at this time with this funding, now we can proceed and get the training that we need for the people to help us um, work it after because this money is only going to last for so long so we need to make sure that we put it into something that is going to be longevity for the tribe in the most positive way so i i'm hoping that we um, again just follow through on some of these um major projects that we have started thank you thank you shirley and james spencer please close us out on this topic yes uh... The, the American Rescue Plan is, is really huge uh, for Native communities across the nation. Uh, it allows us to finally springboard uh, many direct impact programs with a cultural base. Uh, many of these programs that uh, have had to take that back seat due to lack of funding, uh, taking care of our elders, uh, something that we've been trying to do for, for a long time uh, as best we can with the funding that we have. Uh, the mental health component, we have programs currently in place that are culturally based that we can use to help bolster uh, those programs uh, like the Young Horsemen using uh, equine assisted therapy uh, to get the maximum uh, bang for our buck and what we're spending on some of these programs, um, dovetailing some of these programs into uh, others where they where they fit. Um, also, uh, you know, substance abuse and social services programs, um, and uh, a lot of the the rehab for housing and also for energy assistance as we get into alternative energies. Uh, we have an uh, energy assistance program that routinely uh, falls short in funding, so we could use some of this funding to make all of our tribal houses as efficient as possible. Thank you. Thank you, James Spencer. Um, so we're about halfway through with our platforms. We've just got three platforms to go. 
Um, next, we have Mary Jane Miles, the incumbent, and she'll be speaking about her platform, which covers culture and identity, um, a community of one, um, the Nimipu. Thank you. I like Mr. Spencer's uh, talk about the culture of being into and not being introduced, but being used in a lot of our programs. And at one time, um, the table was talking about uh, how when the Japanese put exercise programs in their workplace, they had more work coming out of their workers. And so we were talking about using the roof diggers and the fishermen and uh, hunters going out and not taking annual leave, but doing this and, and returning some of this, the, uh, the fruits to the tribe and have a warehouse. I thought that was a beautiful idea. And I could just see myself posting gone fishing on my door. Uh, I think it's a, a great idea and I think we need to follow through on it. Um, I, of course, am, I have another job here and I, um, I am um, a, a Presbyterian minister, but I am also a native, a Nimipu. And I hear the pride in people's voice when they talk about being Nimipu, as well as I do. I like to dress up and I, when I'm out on the floor with the rest of the Nimipu, it's beautiful out there. We are a beautiful people and we live in a beautiful land. And I feel that we need to hold on to our identity in whatever spiritual walk we are in. It's all the same and it's um, the, uh, the same uh, teachings and preachings and, and just different ways. But I'm just really um, excited about some of these young uh, people that go hunting and uh, go fishing and how they provide for, especially us elders that um, maybe live alone and they bring us meat or fish and, and that's the way, that's the way it is. That's the way we took care of ourselves. I think our history, anywhere you go, and uh, when you say Nez Perce, they say Chief Joseph. And I was over in DC on one trip and the lady that was giving our banquet or, or serving us um, hors d'oeuvres later, when I said Chief Joseph, she said his surrender speech word for word. I can't do that, but I was so happy to run into her. And she said, everybody that goes to school in Washington, D.C. has to learn that speech from where the sun now sits. I will fight no more forever. So that was really a, a plus to the Nimipu. And, and I think their leaders pretty much um, when they go out, ATNI or uh, even NCAI, they are known when you say Nez Perce, uh, they shake their heads almost like yes. So I think we have a lot of natural leaders other than us six here. I think we have a lot out there. And I would I would ask that a lot of you consider running for NEPTIC and consider leading your, your, your people into the future. Um, one of the ladies that's now in the nursing home has always told me she said the Nez Perce have kind hearts and I, I really truly believe in that and I think that um, okay I think that um, there there's just a natural uh, pride about being a Nez Perce and taking care of each other. Kitsiayo. Mm, thank you. Um, Ryan Oatman, do you have some comments that you can share about culture and identity or um, anything off of Mary Jane Miles' comment? Okay, can you hear me? It's more of a comment. I just wanted to thank Mary Jane Miles for um, being present during the pandemic. I know she helped officiate over a lot of the services that took place over the pandemic, and I really respect her for that. And she's one of my grandma's good friends. My grandma likes to terrorize her at a first church. So uh, there was many um, 
services that I attended that, you know, she officiated and she's really comforting at that time for our tribal members, you know, especially during the pandemic to attend a service during a pandemic is different. You know, some are done by Zoom, some you can only have a few friends and family there. So, you know, we really had to make major adjustments that go against our Nimipu culture and, you know, and just kind of go through it. So just a comment, I wanted to thank Mary Jane Miles personally for all she's done for our people. Thank you, Katsuyaya. Thank you. And then Ferris. Thank you. I appreciate all the comments. Um, culture is important. Um, and uh, very important uh, that the foods that we eat kept us healthy. And that's part of the culture. Um, from the indigenous people, South America, Central America, and North America, 67% of the food that's consumed around the world came from the indigenous people of the Americas. A lot of the medicines that were synthesized by the Europeans, aspirin being one of them, the inner bark of the red willow came from the Americas. So we're spiritual people having the material experience. And if we remember that along with the words of everybody here, not just me, but everybody, uh, nothing can stop us, but we got to remember that we're spiritual. Thank you. Thank you, Ferris. And Shirley? Yes, Tat Salah in Winnie Tamakiyu Mai. Hello, I am Shirley Almond. My Indian name is Tamakiyu Mai. I received that from my great great grandmother, Amita Stevens. I live in the Kuski area. I'm from the White Bird Band and I'm the whip lady for the Matalaima um, people up there. So, culture is a very, very important. It's something that we need, it's something that we carry. Um, and it's a pride that we each feel. I mean, it's it, it, we're surrounded by beautiful land because that's who we are. We are the Nez Perce people. Um, and we come from a lot of strong different bands. We're a lot, we're, you know, I heard that um, Nez Perce have tender hearts, but I've also grew up knowing that we were a strong people and we had to make strong, strong decisions and, um, you know, and be proud of who we are. We were we were tough to ourselves so that um, we can endure and be here for today and for those yet to come. Um, I'm a Ala and I'm a Katsa and I'm also a Pox. And I'm very proud of being all of those because that means um, we'll be here for a little more while. So again, I'm just um, thankful for being here. I appreciate this platform and Yochkolo. Um, Thank you, Shirley. Um, and then James, some comments? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, this uh, platform that was brought up. Uh, it speaks to who we are, where we come from. Um, I've been sharing in Esper's stories, our culture and our teachings with people from all around the world uh, on the river boats for over 25 years. And being able to uh, change the minds of people, especially older people who tend to be really set in their ways and they come up to you afterwards and they say, you changed the way I think. As a storyteller, that means that I've done my job. These stories that our people carry on and we have today their teachings, very viable teachings that are as relevant today as they were when they were first told over 16,000 years ago. And we need to carry those forward. 
they are not just teachings just for us as Nimipu, but they are teachings that are for the Titolkan, for the human beings from all around the world. We can all learn from them and their teachings for us all. We can't forget that where we come from. We come from a strong people. Yes, we have tender hearts, but we're very strong and we will fight tenaciously to protect those that we love. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam Penny, will you close us off on this culture and identity topic? Yes, thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> so when Mary Jane talked about identity, she talked about Washington, D.C., and she made me remember the time I was in a cab back there in D.C., and I got in a cab, and there's a black cab driver, and he asked me where I was from, and I told him Nesper's tribe, and I was amazed. Here's what he said. He said, Chief Joseph? I said, yeah. He said, Chief Looking Glass? I said, yeah. And then he said, Chief Whitebird? And I was just amazed on, you know, he knew all that. And you know, the Nespers are, are known worldwide. And, you know, we appreciate, you know, our, our ancestors for all that they did. Uh, just a little bit about this subject, though. You know, uh, native languages are so important. Uh, you know, the, the American Rescue Plan has funding for native languages. Uh, my granddaughter, who just turned 10, uh, I, I feel embarrassed sometimes because, you know, she knows much more than I do. And so we, you know, she corrects me when she tries to tell me to say something. But so I just uh, appreciate, you know, the, the circle of elders. I went to their meeting last week and, you know, they're, they've lost a lot of people over the last year, but you know, appreciate what they do as well. So uh, my time's up, so <laughs> I'll sign off. Wow, this has been amazing. Thank you all for your comments on culture and identity. And I think um, it's clear that we are strong people. Um, the next uh, platform is Ferris Paisano. He'll be talking a little bit about tribal enrollment. Um, so go right ahead, Ferris. Thank you, Cheryl. I picked this topic because I don't have an answer. And I'm depending on five other people here to give me a better picture of enrollment. It has come up in general counsel, I was told, four times. And it was defeated four times. This is an issue that we must address. I talked to a dear friend and elder and he said, when I was on council, we talked about this. He said, we gotta take into consideration descendancy. And he said also DNA. That kind of took me by surprise when he mentioned DNA also. And then he said adoption. Adoption of the Sahaptan speaking tribes. He called them sister tribes or brother tribes. Um, enrollment. A lot of things have happened to us. Boarding schools. My grandparents went to Carlisle. Little did I know that at Carlisle at the same time was my mother, my father's parents, Paris uh, Paisano and uh, um, forgot Bessie Saracino. In boarding school, we had World War II. A lot of our men went into the service and went to Korea, different places. Some of our grandmothers, great grandmothers, went to Portland and Seattle to work in the shipyards. 
building planes or whatever. I don't know. And they've had children during those experiences. More recently, maybe not to some of you, but was relocation. I think some of us are relocation babies where our parents were sent to San Jose, um, Port, uh, Minneapolis, all these different places. And you are the product, a beautiful product. So this is dear to my heart, very dear. Um, our death rate right now is higher than our birth rate. What does that tell you? Um, a comment from a dear friend who's a, a value, a young lady. She said, maybe we should consider rolling kids who spent their whole life in the reservation and are just under the quarter mark. If we change the enrollment for If I say treaty tribes, I rule out the Coeur d'Alene's, the Cogdills, and other tribes that, were, that we have, or, uh, have proximity to. Um, some of us come from the Great Lakes area, have ancestors in the Great Lakes area. And that's from probably uh, our parents working in the BIA. So I don't have an answer to this, but it needs to be addressed Thank you. I left out a lot. Thank you for introducing this topic and platform. Um, a lot of your words resonate with myself. I'm a relocation baby. I'm Nez Persa Navajo. Um, I'm a Navajo who eats salmon. Um, so um, I appreciate this topic. Um, let's keep it moving. Um, I I like that we're not shying away from these topics. Um, please go right ahead, Ryan Oatman. Okay, so with enrollment, it does affect a lot of my family. I have a lot of nieces and nephews who are just under or under um, the blood quantum to be enrolled. And a lot of these nieces and nephews, you know, know a lot about our Nimi culture, fish and hunt and gather where to get the best huckleberries and, you know, can speak the language, you know, quite, quite a bit better than me. Um, I think what would help out in a situation like this is doing like a study and looking at the data of what our tribal members want. I think that would be more effective than bringing it up to the floor at general council. I think um, like doing a survey and uh, just, uh, putting it out there to all the communities on the Nez Perce Reservation and our tribal members who are off reservation, just to just to to get a pulse on what our tribal members are feeling and what their thoughts are on enrollment and if we should open it up. And again, the the enrollment system was created by the United States government. You know, this isn't something that our people, our ancestors, came up with. So, I think uh, looking at data and doing a study on it, some research will really benefit our whole tribe. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Shirley, some comments, please. Yes. Well, this is a very um, strong, sensitive, controversial subject as far as tribal enrollment. Yes, it does need to be, does need to be addressed. We do need to find an answer for that. Um, there's a lot of things that I can hear in the back of my, my mind that my folks would be telling me about this right now. And I think you guys kind of understand where I'm coming from from that. But I also know that today we are the only um, race that has to um, prove our blood quantum. We have, you know, we have to answer to that. So to me, I, 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 would, I do believe that this is a, a very important topic. I do believe that um, it has been to general counsel four times, has failed four times. There was a feasibility study on it. Um, 
but we do need to um, come to come consensus before it is too late. You know, we can't keep dodging this topic um, to get the answer that's going to suit us because I don't know if everybody is going to be um, comfortable with the outcome. Seriously, it's going to be, um, and that's just the kind of people we are. Um, we come, I always say that we come from uh, different bands for reasons because we all, we think a little, slightly little different. Um, but I do, I do understand the importance of tribal enrollment and um, look forward to how we can resolve it. That's the yo-yo. And then uh, James Spencer, comments, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a topic that hits very close to home for me as well. Uh, my father, he's from the Great Lakes area. Uh, I'm in a situation now where I have uh, nieces and grand nieces and nephews, some of which can't be enrolled here because they fall short on the blood quantum, uh, which affects my estate planning. Now, we look at our traditional stories and it only took one drop of blood to make a nest purse. This is, this is 2021. We've sent people to the moon. We've sent probes to Mars. And to this day, there are still only two things that are tracked by blood quantum in this country today. One is livestock, the other is Indians. That has to change. There's no such thing as uh, a full blood nest purse because traditionally we intermarried with people and those people when they married into our tribe were considered, their offspring were considered nest purse. They were raised here. And when they went to their home tribe of their mother or grandparents, they were considered that tribe as well. They were accepted by all. This is something that we have to change and it's within our power to do. It's our decision, not the government's. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on to Sam Penny. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so with, within the Nespers tribe uh, constitution bylaws, you know, that, that's where the issue would have to be addressed. Uh, the quarter blood quantum, there'd have to be an amendment uh, to the tribal constitution. And as mentioned by previous speaker, there was a study conducted. Uh, I served on NEPTIC at the time. We presented that report to the general council uh, I can't recall what year, but it's been several years ago. And the one thing I do remember from that report is that the average lifespan of a Nespers male was uh, age 61 was the, was the average lifespan of a, a Nespers male. But we present that to general counsel also within the, with, it, we discussed at the NEPTIC table is, you know, NEPTIC under the constitution could adopt a resolution, present it to general counsel to vote on on whether you know, to change it or whatever the general counsel would like to do. But what the NEPTIC decided that time is, you know, that's such a big decision that that's something that needs to come from general counsel on what type of language they want within any, any proposed amendment. We didn't think it was up to NEPTIC at the time to decide what language would be in there. So I think it does need to be revisited uh, by the general counsel. And uh, they all say that, you know, when they get, have difficult issues is, you know, present it, you know, have the people decide on what, what they would like. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, Mary Jane Miles, can you close us off on this tribal enrollment topic? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I have grandchildren, two boys that are not enrolled and uh, they want to be enrolled. They they feel their nest person. I do too. <clears throat> I got to go up to visit the Canadian nest purse in um, Canada a couple of years ago. And uh, they, when they made it to Canada, the people up there named them warrior 
they all have the last name Warrior. And I, they are uh, loan support the Nest Purse. And I, I feel that we need to strengthen our Mimipu ties. And, and I know that we don't want to talk about enrollment. No tribe does because they're wondering how to go about um, lessening the blood quantum, accepting other tribes, you know, and I, it's, it's really a hairy situation. And I, I feel we need to just bite the bullet and talk about it anyway. Um, if my grandchildren are not enrolled, then their children are not going to be enrolled anywhere. And we don't want to go out uh, that way. So we need to, we need to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, we are talking about it here and I really appreciate everyone for your candid responses. Um, uh, we're moving on to our last platform. It's Ryan Oatman. He'll be talking a little bit about health, education and welfare. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I'd just like to start off by introducing myself. I'm a, uh, my name is Ryan Oatman. I'm originally from Kamei. I'm a Nespers tribal member from the Looking Glass Band. I am a resident of Lapway. I'm a social worker by education. I'm very engaged with uh, our community, communities on the reservation. And I'm a active stick gamer. I love to play stick games. <laughs> Um, so my, my topic is going to be human services, education, and economic development. So to start off with human services, I've been in social services for the last decade, last 10 years. And one of the things that I was blessed with with my last program at iVision is learning about CQI, which is continuous quality improvements. And throughout our the duration of our program, we learned about CQI process and we had a really awesome training and technical um, assistance from Public Strategies, which is out of Oklahoma. So C the CQI process <clears throat> helps with programs looking at data and this data will help programs make the needed changes to their programs to better serve their uh, clients or their patients. Um, so with our CQI, we, like I said, we, uh, worked with public strategies and they gave us like an improvement plan, like template. And with that, we were able to, um, put out goals by utilizing the SMART model, which SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So benchmarks are really important to our program. And they gave us, you know, different benchmarks to achieve things to improve our services for our youth and our young adults. Um, and going to surveys, you know, I think that would be really important for tribal members to be able to um, fill out satisfactory surveys for the services provided for the tribal members on our Nest Push Reservation. Also employee satisfactory surveys, supervisor evaluations, employee evaluations. Um, if I'm elected on NEPTIC, you know, I'd want to be evaluated too. So I'm not sure what the current evaluation is for uh, elected NEPTIC officials. And also uh, tribal member comment forms. I work at Nimipu Health and patients are able to fill out a patient comment form to uh, bring up issues or complaints or even to give us um, positive feedback, what we're doing right. So I think that would be something that would be important to, and beneficial to the Nespers tribe as a whole, that in the CQI process. And then with education, um, continued support for adult education, Head Start, Students for Success, the STEP program, the HOIST program, our tribal college, Northwest Indian College, LCSC, U of I, uh, our vocational and technical training. I think helping our tribal members get education will open up doors for them professionally. Uh, also, I'd like to see more programs visible in Orfino and in Kamei. I'd like to see the Boys and Girls Club established in Kamei, a wellness center. Also, if we're not going to do anything with the bait shop in Orfino, I think that, that could be used as a wellness center too for uh, tribal members to work out. Um, for economic, 
Um, I was looking at Zim's as a possible place to build a casino because we have Treasure Valley just right over the hills. And um, a lot of, you know, folks that be spending time at a casino at Zim's and spending money. And also looking at our Oregon and Washington gaming compacts and seeing what kind of gaming we can bring to those states since we now have land in both states. And lastly, to expand our uh, Nest Purse Expresses to Camia and Arpino. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let's move on to Shirley Allman for some comments. Go ahead, Shirley. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the higher education and supporting all the education, starting from early head start all the way through to um, graduate school. But what I what we really need to understand is when they go to um, dedicate their years for their educational goal, we need to have a plan or work um, proactively to bring them back into the tribe. We're losing a lot of good educated um, tribal members because they're either overqualified or um, we can't find jobs for them, but somehow we can find jobs for um, people who we want to. So I feel like we really need to push our, push our tribal people to school. I wish that we could um, hold up the resolutions that were passed at general council twice now that supported that the department of managers that are non nest purse mentor um, a graduate um, tribal member so that we have that um, longevity with our own people. We have a lot of dedicated tribal members that are starting their families, they're educated, but we, we, um, we don't um, compensate them like they should be compensated in the, in the real world. So I really uh, believe that and I also, um, agree with the um, mental awareness. We need to keep the, um, like the fitness center and camera would be a great thing. But anyway, that's my time and thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move on to James Spencer. Yes, thank you. Uh, Education is very important. Um, not only uh, in college degrees, but we also, are going to require uh, people in certain trades. So trade schools need to be em emphasized as well. Um, and as far as bringing people back, you know, as was mentioned, we have people that want to come back and work for the tribe, but they're unable to. We need to have that pathway where if we assist them in their education, that they will come back and serve our people. That's important to give back after you've received from the tribe. I don't believe that there's any such thing as being overqualified. If they're willing to work, then let's let them work. The Nespers people deserve nothing less than the most qualified people working for them. And it's our job as leaders, as the government, to ensure that our tribal members have the support and opportunities available to them so that they will be the most qualified and be competitive in any job market that they choose to enter into. Thank you. Thank you. Sam? Yes, thank you. Well, the first thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, recently we've read about the Idaho State Legislature and the funding of uh, higher education institutions. I think that's a big step backward. Uh, they've also, you know, regarding teachers' pay. So I think there are things on the statewide level that we that we really need to address because we know we all know most of our students are within the public school systems. So I think we need to really keep an eye on that and uh, hold the Idaho State Legislature accountable for their actions. Uh, when I went to the Circle of Elders the other day. One of the things they talked about and someone mentioned a moment ago is that you know, they want tribal services to be reservation wide, that we have tribal members in all areas of the reservation and that, you know, that they also need services that, that they can obtain here uh, locally in Lapway. And as far as health, the American Rescue Plan has $6 billion that IHS will use various categories. So I think it's, it's a opportunity for us to improve 
you know, some of the things that we need to, to improve as far as the utilizing that funding to improve areas that are allowable under that rescue plan. And, and I guess finally, just the housing shortage that we really need to address the housing shortage, affordable housing. I know that the housing just got a, a grant for some units, but you know, we, we have a greater need to that. I think you know, we continue to work with housing to address uh, housing here on the reservation. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jane Miles. Thank you. I've been advocating for education all my life and I've gone to school all my life as well. Night school and working and taking my little guy to basketball games. And so it's been a, a really lively life. I want to thank um, Ryan for his remarks on um, myself here. But I want to thank him also for turning my grandson's life around. He was really going the wrong way. And through the program that Ryan was in, uh, he turned his life around. And he is a father now, a proud little father. So I ran into him in Washington, DC and got a picture taken with him with um, uh, Obama as the backdrop. So that was really something. And it was during, uh, to, uh, thanks to Ryan's efforts in his job. I think that our welfare system is <clears throat> really great. It um, takes care of, we have special programs for elders, but I think we need more people uh, in these uh, caretaker positions just to go and check on um, those that are homebound and those that are in the, uh, the nearby um, nursing homes, uh, they feel like they're a million miles away. And I guess they are. So we need to um, think about that seriously. Thank you. Thank you. And Ferris, um, close us off on this topic, please. Education is very important. And uh, we start really young. But where it really starts is in the home, just like Sam alluded to his, his granddaughter, like everybody's talked about, it's in the home. Um, as we progress through the primary, intermediate, middle school, high school, secondary degrees, We fill our minds, our brains with information. But truth enters the heart and ends up here in reason. And that's what our ancestors knew. They educated our hearts. We need to go back to educating our hearts. Um, health. addiction. What I'm told is that we dig in the dust looking for the pure spirit, control, alcoholism, drug, whatever it is. That's why we're digging into dust. Thank you. To find a true spirit. The truth. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into a different, so we've completed the platforms. Um, you've learned a little bit about each candidate and their opinions on basic topics. Uh, we're going to ask a leadership question. So the question is, many Nimipu would like to see a tribal government, our tribal government engage in policy programs and projects that embrace a native nation building approach. Um, we want to see a thriving tribal nation where our economic, educational, health, and cultural needs are not only served, but achieved through innovation, sustainability, and are culturally grounded in our way of life as Nimipu people. To achieve this, we need leadership to agree on a number of things with our tribal citizens, amongst themselves, and for future generations. Um, we see these long-term nation building goals in mind. Um, 
Can you describe your leadership style, for example, how you navigate relationships and conversations that are difficult, um, or describe interactions that you've had where you've had to listen and learn um, and lead in ways that benefit the collective, um, our entire community, instead of individuals or single families. Um, there will be times when leadership is called on to manage conflict and how might you address internal or external conflict differently or in a consistent manner? Um, lastly, NEPTIC are elected tribal leaders that represent the collective of all of our communities and all of our people um, for well being and for future generations. How might you balance these interactions with external pressures? So uh, we can move on to a little bit of comments about leadership and this question broadly. Please go ahead, Mary Jane Miles. Thank you, Cheryl. I would say that I'm very proud of um, what happened today with ABC, um, with our chairman and with our communications over there. They were interviewed by ABC, so we might see them on the national scene. But they have just come back. Some of them have just come back from Hamilton as well, meeting with a lot of leadership uh, from different tribes. And that is very thrilling to see. And it's so thrilling to see uh, like Deb Halen being put into that high position, Jamie Pinkham, and, and uh, just the, the leaders that um, we have. I always think about the the olden days, older than me, and when the leaders were natural because they led the people through the wilderness, through the forest. So here is a, a chance to uh, hone up your leaders, leadership qualities. I think that um, listening to the people is really important. And that's a good time to listen is at uh, general council and take your notes and talk to people about what they were talking about. And I would like to see our, our um, tribe just thrive on uh, finances. And I would like to see everybody working and uh, taking care of their families and enjoying a good life and it, it, it can be done. And uh, these long-term nation goals are things that you have to sit down and think about and put into place no matter how hard it takes. And, and to be a team with the Kuyets where there's nine of you on there. And so you need to uh, work together. And I know we don't all agree sometimes, but that's okay. I'm glad we don't, uh, we're not all alike. And that'd be really boring if we were. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and Ryan, some comments on leadership. So <clears throat> I think what makes a good leader is to be accessible to your constituents here on the Nez Perce Reservation and off reservation. To always be accessible and to be approachable in all communities, you know, to be to feel comfortable in every community and to listen to what your constituents are saying or what their concerns are. Um, another thing is to spend in your own personal time, you know, volunteering in the communities. You know, um, the last 10 years I've been volunteering my time to do the teen nights for our youth for uh, middle school to high school. And um, also, let's see, just the different jobs I've held over the last 10 years with the iVision, with Child Protection Services, Students for Success, um, helping Mike Bisbee out with their COVID-19 relief, you know, during the pandemic, um, delivering food across the reservation. I think a good leader has good ethics. Uh, cultural values, um, sober living. You know, I pass no judgment on anyone that's battling drugs or alcohol, but being sober has opened so many doors for me. Uh, being able to handle conflict and provide resolution, uh, being accountable and dependable, lead by example. And most important, to be down in the trenches with your people, especially during natural disasters in this worldwide pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. 
and Ferris. Thank you. Um, I think humility is very important that um, we see each other as equals. Everyone has value. And sometimes because of life circumstances, it's hard for us to see the value. But if you put that in your forefront of your mind that everybody has value and everybody has worth, then you're miles ahead. And to listen um, to what people have to say and take it to heart. Now, for me personally, I don't want to be praised or criticized, but just treated as are treated as a human being. Hello, how are you? Have a good day. And that's the beginning step. We will develop that more after it comes. And so we look at it, we meet a person and we see what their strength is, what they like, and we build on that strength. Strength to strength is how we learn. I taught school for 32 years and I taught weakness to weakness. Well, you don't know this, you don't know that. And I did it all wrong. I wish I could go back. I can't. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam. Well, thank you. On the, the first question, describe your leadership style. I think when you serve on NEPTIC, you almost have to have a democratic type of, of leadership style. The reason I say that is because you work with so many people. You only work with employees. You work with... Uh, tribal membership, you work with subcommittee, you know, we work with general counsel. So, you know, everyone needs to be, be involved in, in the decision-making process. And I think most of all is that we all need to, you know, if we're elected, you know, have a servant leadership style that we uh, conduct our duties to serve the needs of the people. On the second question, how do you navigate relationships when conservations are difficult and opinions vary? I think that first of all, you have to be a good listener. Um, if you're in a meeting or if you're even conducting the meeting, you know, you need to maintain or orderly discussion so that you no know, things stay within a, a civil civil matter uh, at the table. And you know, don't automatically take sides uh, on any of the issues. You know, you need to listen to both sides, uh, hopefully help them to resolve it uh, informally uh, amongst themselves. And so describe interactions where you have had to listen, learn, and lead in ways that benefit collective, collective instead of individuals. And a couple of examples I can recall was, you know, on the tobacco tax and the fuels tax, that were very controversial issues with, with many of our uh, tribe members. So as far as managing conflict, I think, you know, we have manuals that we need to utilize, the human resource manuals, we have chains of command, uh, encourages informal resolution. And externally, I think we just need to listen to, to all parties involved and uh, before we you know, take any action. Thank you. Thank you. And Shirley, some comments on leadership, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I believe leadership um, comes with knowing who you are and where you come from, know your values, know your strengths, I believe that um, when you're honest with yourself, that it's um, noticeable. So that way you, you're approachable. Um, you wanna treat um, your team as a team. You wanna work together. Like it was uh, said before, you wanna um, tap into their individual strengths. I, be I believe that a good leader is honest, is trustworthy, has strong ethics, is confident, and um, is also approachable to learn. A leader, is, just because you're a leader does not mean that it's your way or the highway or you, you know it, you're, you're the leader to help um, bring your, your group, your team to the top. You wanna, and they might, you might fall, you might have disagreements, but you still push forward. Um, I think 
Our leadership value is um, for NEPTIC would be to take it back to um, the general council. We have a general council for a purpose to hear from our constituents, to hear from our um, people, what they want, what their concerns are, what their worries are. A good leader would take that back to the table and, and see it through. If we can't follow policy that has been written, then policy needs to be changed that we follow it. We just don't develop um, policy to suit us. There was policies made um, to be followed. So um, I, I believe a leader would be to listen to your um, people, help them see why things are the way they are and help them to improve it um, so that everybody can move forward. And we're always progressing. We don't want ever want to be in a standstill. Um, as a leader, it's very important that everybody feels an accomplishment. Everybody feels proud of being a part of it. And, and I just hope that um, that, uh, that will be the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And James, can you finish off this topic? Yes, thank you. Um, I think a, a strong, you know, in the past we've had strong leaders and they had certain qualities that they demonstrated that drew people towards them and made people look to them and look up to them. These were the people that would allow uh, everyone the opportunity to demonstrate their strengths and their weaknesses and place those people in positions that would be of the maximum benefit to the collective. And putting these teams together and setting them up for success by knowing everybody's strengths and weaknesses and putting them in, the, in those places. Um, I would like to see uh, ethics and government statutes instituted open meeting laws where agendas have to be posted so that people can know what our leaders are discussing and when they're discussing them. So if there's an issue that is important to them, they can make the arrangements to be there to have their say and be a part of that discussion in real time, rather than waiting four months or waiting uh, you know, four months to get to their, their minutes or um, having to wait twice a year to voice the concerns in uh, general counsel. Uh, leaders would know, a strong leader would know when it's time to go back to the people and ask the people for their input in order for them to make sound decisions. We need to have those open lines of communication in order to be successful and move into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that completes our leadership discussion. Um, we're gonna transition into current events. So this is an opportunity for all of the candidates to share um, a two minute um, comment period on any topic or current event of their choice. We're gonna go ahead and start with Ferris Paisano. If you could just um, let us know your current event um, before you begin speaking, that'd be great. I'm gonna choose drug and alcohol. Um, addiction, basically what I'm talking about is addiction. In the past few years, I have traveled the country a lot, met a lot of educated people of many races, very wealthy to the very poor. And one addiction that I saw that amazed me was control. Anybody who has control issues had the same behavior as my alcohol addiction or whatever, same, same behaviors. I learned by watching my elders to become a predator. I learned by watching my elders, this is what you do with alcohol. Being not very smart, I thought alcohol was cultural because it was in basketball, it was at powwows, it was at stick games. So I thought it was cultural. 
Nobody told me it was the addiction. And that's what we need to let them know that, you know, it's addiction. And by changing your life, you will influence somebody else. A song changed my life. It was by Harry Chapin called Cats in the Cradle. Had my nephew at the gathering. And when he sang that song, he's going to grow up and be just like me. That night I stopped everything. I wish I could have gone to um, learn about uh, my next addiction become Pepsi. So you see all us old alcoholics drinking diet Pepsi. That's our addiction. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam, introduce your topic before beginning. Yes, I'm going to talk about the copy, uh, topic of the current administration. And what I like to talk about is, you know, of course, we have President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, in office right now for the next four years. Uh, the next presidential election will take place November 5th of 2024. And currently in the 117th Congress, and the reason I think this is an important issue is because there's three ways we can be directly effective. That's either through the executive branch of the government, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch of the federal government. So I think it's important that we uh, keep close watch on what goes on at the national level. And the midterm elections are coming up in two years on November 8th of 2022. So currently in the US House of Representatives, there are 218 Democrats, 212 Republicans and five vacancies. So in two years, all 435 of the US House seats are gonna be up for reelection in 2022. And in the Senate, there are 48 Democrats and 50 Republicans. And there's two independents, but they caucus with the, with the Democrats. So that's why we have a 50-50 split in the Senate. And then, of course, you see the news where uh, Vice President Harris sometimes casts a deciding vote. But in 2022, 34 of those 100 Senate seats are going to be up for election. Uh, there'll be 14 Democrats up for election. There'll be 20 Republicans up for election. So I think it's going to be important that that you know, we keep close watch on these uh, races because things can change very quickly. You know, right now we're in a good position with uh, the current Congress and the president, but in, in the midterm elections, so we need to be diligent in our work and make sure that you know, we get all that we can get done within the next, especially the next two years, but hopefully four years. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And Shirley. Okay, current event. Um, I will pick dam removal. I picked dam removal because it's a topic that's going on right now. Um, we're about the, as close as we're going to we've ever been in getting these dams removed. It, it's astonishing how um, this is affecting our salmon. It's going, we're gonna have, when we, my great grandchild will not be able to go salmon fishing if we do not have this dam removal. We have to take this crazy step right now. It might seem crazy because it's four dams and, and there's a lot of people, um, questioning it because of you know what's going to be the alternative as energy um, renewable energy and how we're going to barter everything up up the stream but they do have plans in in place to approach all of those but this is a big change that is affecting a lot of people and a lot of people um, are very un uncomfortable with change we all are you know because uh, it's something that it's uncertain but we know with the data that we have collected as the Nez Perce tribe with the fisheries and the watershed and all their studies, quick fit, all of them um, have months and years of data support, documentation to support that this needs to happen. It should have happened um, earlier. So we wouldn't be caught in this crazy situation that we are now that it will, we seen the numbers brought into the office the other day um, from fisheries and the um, runs returning are 
almost obsolete. Salmon's almost extinct. So without this um, dam re removal, it's gonna be um, a scary situation for us as native people. That's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, before moving on to James, I just want to let you know that you can talk about any topic you wish. You can repeat topics. Um, you can choose some of the examples we've already highlighted. Um, so go right ahead, James. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to jump on uh, dam removal and uh, as it affects uh, climate change. Uh, it's important they, they dovetail. Um, a lot of our, our uh, issues that we face, uh, we're thinking of them only as single issues, but they actually have ramifications in other areas as well. Uh, just like in uh, Western medicine, they discovered that they need to start treating everybody holistically. Well, environmentally, we need to start treating this earth holistically. And so dam removal is, is a baby step in the right direction. Uh, is it the silver bullet that's going to bring all of the salmon back? No, not by any means, but it is a step in the right direction. We currently read in the paper today about the Corps of Engineers wanting to increase flows. You know, why are we doing this now at this critical junction? Uh, uh, elder, went to a meeting with the Corps of Engineers once and the Corps of Engineers was talking about how they maintain the river at historic flow, flow levels. And this elder said, you're right. We've been at high water since those dams went in. So they need to come out. They're not managing for fish, they're managing for the farmers for irrigation. And they're using salmon as justification to increase the flows for irrigators who planted crops and created farms in areas that were not suitable for farming. The notion of the Bureau of Reclamation I find is really uh, quite amusing because that assumes that uh, that was once theirs to reclaim and it wasn't. So the whole thing needs to be rethought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Mary Jane. Thank you. I'm choosing MMIW, Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women. Um, I've gone to a couple of these conferences and I'm just astounded at um, how slow Congress has acted to even recognize that Indigenous women have been killed throughout the centuries with no justice for them. I was aware of this when I went to summer school at Vancouver, Canada, and the Canadian First Nations were really fighting uh, that they would be taken to court, whoever either raped or uh, killed um, First Nation women. It took an act of Congress to to get this out in the forefront there. And uh, when we were on the second uh, conference, I was there, uh, one of the ladies, uh, it was mostly uh, women there. One of the women got up and wanted to know who the heck wrote this. And it was somebody in Washington DC that wrote it that had no cultural experience of reservation life. But it's got so many um, idiosyncratic um, things in it that it doesn't really pertain to reservation life. So uh, I, th I like this movement now that uh, where they are uh, editing it to where it will be effective on the res, on the res life. Um, I'm thankful that the Nimibu have not been hit as bad as some of our neighboring um, neighboring tribes, but we are all tribal people and it hurts. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. And Ryan, please close this portion off. Okay, so I'm choosing the current administration 
And I'd like to talk about some of the native leaders that we have, uh, starting off with Deb Halen, you know, Pebble, from the Pueblo Laguna. She is now our um, United States Secretary of Interior. I really liked her, uh, her quote about standing on the shoulders of her ancestors. So I believe all of us are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, you know, our ancestors that went through the war with the United States government, went through all the wars going up into Canada. Um, I know Deb, with the federal government, you know, will work to address environmental justice every day in her um, new position. The Department of Interior oversees the Bureau of Indian Education as well as the Bureau of Indian Affairs and their work intersects with the lives and interests of about 1.9 million indigenous people in 574 federally recognized tribes across the country. And I know um, she is looking into the missing murdered indigenous woman. Um, on a state level for Idaho, I know Rudy Sato is trying to start a democratic native caucus for the state of Idaho. And I'm currently trying to help him recruit natives in Idaho to join this um, new caucus. I know other um, states have um, indigenous or native caucuses, you know, in their states. So if there's any interested tribal members, just reach out to me and I can get you hooked up. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Um, next, we are moving into one of the final questions, which is get out the vote. So we have our election, our tribal election coming up. Um, Will candidates please share a little bit about why this is such an important process to be a part of, why voting matters within our community, tribal communities in general, um, why this is important for um, our younger generations to get involved. So Shirley, please. Thank you. Um, yes, um, the younger um, generation, the next generation is a larger group of um, individuals in all races. And I, I believe that they need to take um, focus on what's going on. And I, I kind of think that they are um, being actively involved. And I, I believe that um, as an election judge, it's really curious, it's really um, satisfying when you see high numbers. That means that the tribal membership is showing interest in what's going on within their tribal um, government. So, and now that we have um, absentee ballots, I'm hoping that the families will get together and um, promote and, and have a discussion about why they need to vote. Because this um, absentee ballot goes out to everyone that's 18 and over. So we're gonna hit them uh, one way or another if it's, um, you know, but it really needs to start at home. I, I think that um, the absentee ballots will hopefully help that. And it's just very important for them to get involved to know what their tribal's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And James? Yes, voting is very important because that is your voice. That is how you are heard. You need to be involved in your government. You need to vote. You need to encourage your family to vote. I know sometimes we can feel really frustrated and sometimes we can get gets atmos and say, oh, I'm not gonna go down there and vote. Well, now that we have mail-in voting, there's no more excuses. Get out and vote. You have to engage in your government if you want to see any change. If you don't vote, your voice isn't heard one way or the other. If you don't vote, you're still voting. You're voting for the status quo. So get out and vote. Thank you. Mary Jane? Thank you. I like to hear it when my nephew tells his uh, boys, you know, you have to vote because then I don't want you complaining about anything. He says, you, like you said, that you need to vote and your, vo your vote does count. I am so happy we do have absentee ballots too because some of the people that are um, away from the reservation are really interested in their leadership and how the tribe is going and now, now they get to vote. So I like to vote all the time I have been voting but I like to get that little sticker that says 
I voted because I'm really proud of it when I do vote, even for the regional or national elections. I think we have a really good go-to vote uh, uh, committee because they're always bugging you too to get out and vote too. Okay, there's one of them right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Ryan. Okay, so I've been voting since I was 18 with our tribal elections. And I started voting in our national elections when I was 21. But with the tribal elections, I kind of had no choice. My auntie kind of drug all of us boys over to the general council, got us involved and made us sit through the meetings and then, you know, voting for all the positions. So it's always been instilled in me as, you know, a young 18 year old. I also have um, my outlet Loda and her sisters that were very, very vocal and they would drive down from Kamiya to meet with Neptic and, you know, demand change. And um, I had a foster kid that was living with me. And when he turned 18, I had him vote in tribal elections and the national elections. So it just kind of trickled on down to me and me on down to my foster child. Thank you. And Ferris? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with all the comments before. Um, and I want to stray just a little bit. We had a controversy about the Cherry Lane Bridge. Um, and the uh, county commissioners felt slighted because they weren't included. So they're the ones that kind of, uh, the state agreed with it, the federal agreed with it, but the county commissioners felt slighted. So they put it in the paper that uh, there were, Next person to close it down. That wasn't true. So we need to get out and vote and vote for whoever you want, but just vote. I've, I've always voted and uh, I've gone to the warehouse in Sweetwater when I lived in Sweetwater, you know. So it's very important to vote and uh, that's how uh, our, hopefully our voices are heard. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Sam. Well, thank you. So I went back and looked at a little bit of history uh, the last few days and came across something interesting that you know, the 14th Amendment, which was passed in 1866, you know, making all persons of the United States citizens, Indian on reservations were specifically excluded from that at that time. And then of course we had the Indian Citizen Citizenship Act, but of 1924, but that still didn't guarantee the right to vote. And then more recently, over the next couple of days, we're going to be had to see some uh, World War II veteran uh, headstone settings. But at that time, if they would return home, you know, they would they wouldn't have the, the right to vote. So, you know, it made me think about you know their their sacrifices and uh, according to the instructions of the thing I. It said to write something and how you felt about that. And after I thought about them, I, I thought, you know, especially these veterans, do not do not let their psych sacrifices or ancestors and veterans, men and women, go by the wayside, especially those that gave the ultimate sacrifice of their lives for the rights we possess today. So, you know, we need to remember all those that got us to this point. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about the importance of voting. Um, now we're wrapping up here and here's your opportunity to share a closing statement, a final statement, what you wanna share. Um, let's go ahead and just get started with Mary Jane. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to come and uh, talk to <clears throat> each other and then talk to the tribe. And I wanna thank you all for all your efforts that you have done. Uh, even in the first platform as well, especially the Wheeler family has been um, really out in front a lot of times leading us forward. I've always had a volunteer spirit um, when, when I wanted to work for something, I would rather volunteer for something. I um, 
get a kick out of the youth teaching me how to talk to Tilka Timki. If I have to give a, a speech or something, I call the cultural program up and they come and uh, rehearse me. And you can teach an old dog new tricks. And then I like the uh, want to uh, advocate for age discrimination. I am an elder, but I have the energy yet to uh, work for you if you would allow me. And I thank you for uh, listening to all of us and, and blessings on you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ryan? So in closing, I'm thankful for the opportunity to run for NEPTIC seat one. Uh, I've been a lifelong resident of the Nespers Reservation my whole life, you know, living in Kamiya and Lapway. Um, I did go off to college and I did get my education. You know, I have my MSW and after I uh, received my education, I brought it back to the Nespers tribe. You know, there's no greater place I wanna work. I love all the communities on the reservation. So I'm blessed to be able to provide services for such a long time on our reservation. Um, about myself, I'm a good listener. I'm honest. I go by a set of ethics that help guide me. I also have a group of elders that help guide me. <clears throat> I am approachable and I am accessible. And I'd just like at this time to thank you for your support and vote for Ryan seat one. Thank you. That's the aya. Thank you. And Ferris. I just, oh, thank you. I just like to reflect on statements previously stated. You know, 16,000 years we've been here. We've been here for the Bonneville flood, the Missoula flood. Um, we've been through three ice floats. Uh, we've been here a long time, but every mountaintop, every valley, every river, we greeted the day with prayer. So what we did was we blessed the spot for the business to come. We made the place holy and sanctified. And that's who we are. And just like to encourage the people to vote. Um, that's a sacred duty too. Our life is sacred. So we have to understand the sacredness of all things. And be like the great ocean. The great ocean lowers itself. So all the, from the mountaintop, everywhere runs to it. Why? because it lowers itself and tracks the water. That's who we have to be as leaders. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam? Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank the Native, Native Vote Committee for hosting this and, and the moderator. And to the Nespers tribe membership, you know, I just want them to know that I'm committed to listening to your concerns. I'm a team player, but I also make my decisions based on the best overall interest of the Nespers tribe and tribal membership. And I carefully analyze every issue before I make a decision or vote. And I currently work with Student for Success, you know, working with, uh, on suicide prevention, uh, binge drinking, and alcohol and marijuana use. And the, I can see from working there, you know, the needs that our youth have, have today. So I respectfully ask for your vote uh, for seat Number two, Katsuyayo, thank you. And Shirley. Hello, um, thank you. I, first of all, I wanna say uh, thank you to all those that um, supported me in the primary. I really appreciate your support and I do ask for your support again during the general election. I um, would hope to continue to um, serve you and um, I hope to um, help all the communities all up and down the river, uh, Kuski, Kamiai, Orfino, and Lapway. I, I just want to bring back the um, joy of working and being in Nespers. I believe there's a lot of things that um, need to be shared um, with the general council. There's a lot of things that the general council has on their mind. And I believe if we can just communicate, open the lines of communication to where you all know what's going on and that we are working the best of our ability with your interest in, in our mind and in our heart. Uh, again, um, 
I just ask for the opportunity to serve you for the next three years and vote for me on C3. Thank you. And James. Yes, uh, I'd like to, to thank the Native Vote Committee for hosting this event, uh, making this possible, uh, all the hard work that went into putting it together. Uh, it's important for us to look back and study the teachings that were left to us by our ancestors and all of those great leaders that came before us in order to propel us in to the future. We have a lot of bright individuals that we need to tap into, a valuable resource. It starts from a very young age, from our early childhood development, all the way up through secondary school or trade schools. We need to support our people and above all, people need to engage in their government. They need to utilize all of the tools at, that are at their disposal. That means go to your resolutions committee, go to your general counsel and go vote for James Spencer, seat three. Wow, well, for everyone um, for sharing all of your kind words, helping inform um, our communities. Um, we're hoping to increase engagement, um, increase voter turnout. Um, hopefully this forum platform um, virtual event has provided an opportunity for everyone um, to learn a little bit more about our candidates. Um, I just wanna reiterate that the general election is on May 8th. Um, you can vote for seat one, two, and three. Um, seat one candidates are Ryan Oatman and the incumbent Mary Jane Miles. Seat two, Ferris Paisano, the incumbent, and Sam Penny. And seat three, Shirley Ullman, the incumbent, and James Spencer. Um, polls open on May 8th at 7 a.m. and they close at 3 p.m. Um, so please go vote. Um, thank you all for joining us.